I actually learned uh, about a couple months prior to the launch that none of the crew members on this mission had ever scrubbed a launch. So uh, as we left the ONC building, I guess we had two thoughts. One was we're either on a really good streak and we're going to launch tonight or we've used up most of our good luck. As it turned out, it was an absolutely gorgeous night. They say that you could see the launch all the way up to New York City. It was so uh, clear that night. But the main engine's light and we take the uh, second heaviest payload ever into uh, orbit aboard the shuttle at 35,000 pounds, it was mentioned earlier. This is a view inside, and then you'll have a view outside the shuttle of what it looked like. And if you look in the foreground, you can see all the fish jumping out of the water. <laughs> I guess they were happy to see us go as well. <laughs> Into the roll program, and then about, uh, this is the business end of the jet, actually. And if you look, you can see the body flap moving back and forth a little bit. And two minutes into the flight, we get rid of the SRBs. This is what it looked like from the inside. And we're on our way to uh, 17,500 miles per hour as we begin the chase of uh, the station. Once we were in orbit, we had to convert this rocket ship into our home and workplace. And part of that uh, involved preparing our suits for the launch, or for the EVAs. Well, the first uh, critical task we had uh, once we were in orbit was to get, uh, obviously, rendezvoused and docked to the station. There you see a terrific view of the shuttle as it approaches in the P-6 in the payload bay. You can see it occupies almost the entire bay. Uh, that's our docking port on the station. Um, I was a little bit concerned about the offsets in, in the CGs and uh, the, the capture performance once we actually made contact. You can see that, uh, unfortunately, um, a lot of the good things that happen on orbit tend to happen at night, and that is actually sunset on the station. The view you have now, uh, you just saw, was the centerline target uh, that we use to align the orbiter and uh, do the final approach. That is the station docking mechanism on the top and the shuttle me mechanism below, and you'll see that scene again here in a second. There's the final view of the centerline target as we get very close. And we'll go back to the outside here in a second. And you can see we're closing fairly slowly, only at about a tenth of a foot per second. I have to admit I was, I was very anxious about this moment. Uh, the potential for uh, failure in the mission was uh, great if we did not dock. So we were pretty excited on the flight deck once it happened. It took a couple minutes to get the hooks uh, driven. And then after that, uh, we were all happy to have this part of the mission behind us. Well, there we are on the station. You can see it at the moment. Uh, the modules all lined up, the uh, Unity and FGB and uh, Zvezda, and at the very back, uh, the uh, Soyuz vehicle. Very shortly after docking, we had to start uh, the arm up so that we could take the uh, P-6 out of the bay, and you can see it being taken out of the bay. And we're going to park it uh, high above the cargo bay so that uh, it's in a friendly thermal position. and. Uh, it's a fairly big object, so uh, with 45 feet and, and weighing about 35,000 pounds, we had to do it very carefully. And there it is in the overnight uh, park position. And the following morning, uh, I took it and positioned it about three feet above the Z1 structure where you see it uh, in this picture. It's a pretty tight fit getting into the suit. In the, uh, as a matter of fact, it's a pretty f tight fit in the airlock as well. And Brent and Mark did a fantastic job getting us in. It's a real team effort. There's plenty of room outside, though, and uh, here Carlos and, <laughs> Carlos and I are on our way to work. The, this is the first flight of the uh, wireless video s system, the helmet cam, uh, that gives you this absolutely fantastic view of uh, P6 as Mark brings it down. It's, the motion is slow, but you might be able to see a little bit of it there. We're verifying alignment. Mark uh, drives it down close enough, uh, within a couple inches, for Carlos to drive the capture latch uh, to engage the Rocketdyne truss attachment system, and then we drive four bolts to... Uh, hold P6 and Z1 together. Once P6 was made it onto Z1, uh, Mark relinquished control of the arm to Mike, and the first thing I did was jump on a portable foot restraint and connect connectors uh, between the Z1 and the P6. This would allow power to flow from P6 to the station as well as data and put, uh, allow us to command it. Meanwhile, Joe was up high removing these launch restraints that uh, protected the blanket boxes during the launch environment, the high G's and the vibrations. Uh, that would allow me uh, to rotate out the beta gimbal, and Joe did another one later. Unfortunately, this happened at night, so this is a view out of our uh, night uh, camera, the, the B camera. 
Uh, it was supposed to swing out on its own on a spring, but uh, things don't always work as expected, and I had to do a lot of pushing, as did Joe on his uh, mast when it uh, swung out. Once it was completely out, I crawled out onto the end of the mast uh, tip fitting and swung out the blanket boxes. Uh, each box weighed about 800 pounds, but it was just fingertip pressure to make it uh, go all the way out. At that point, I'm about 100 feet from the bottom of the payload bay of the orbiter. Well, with uh, Joe and Carlos complete with their task and the ground complete with its activation task, it was time to deploy the first array. Uh, we actually commanded that uh, sequence to start from on board the, the shuttle on the aft flight deck. And you can see uh, th the mast come out of the canister, and it's amazing that over 100 feet of mast is uh, folded up into that canister, as well as the uh, solar array blankets. We had a great view from outside, and the still pictures that we took are absolutely fantastic. Some of the panels uh, stuck together, and they would eventually release themselves, but uh, as they did, you, you could see the dynamics in the array. They got more and more dynamic uh, to the point where, where finally, the, uh, at this release here on the left box in your picture, the uh, subsequent crashing down, if you will, will was enough to uh, cause uh, both tension lines on both tension reels, and here it is right there, to come off of the tension reel. You can see the resultant uh, motion in the blanket box, or the blankets. Pretty dynamic. Well, after a hard day of work on top of P6, the translation home and the view was just absolutely fantastic. We followed the, the uh, handrail highway that they had provided for us all the way down to the, to the orbiter, to the airlock. And it wasn't until we got on the side of the node that we could actually see the orbiter windows. Well, at the end of EVA-1, we had uh, the starboard solar array deployed, uh, not tensioned because of the, the, the problem with the tension cable. But the ground worked very hard overnight to give us a new procedure uh, to deploy the port array. And this is the port array being deployed. You can see the same sticking phenomena in the, in the blankets. However, what we did on this deploy was start and stop the mast about every eight feet and to minimize that problem. And there is uh, sunset on the array, and you can see the spectacular colors that, that we were able to see on orbit. It's a good picture to give you an idea of the size of the station now. From tip to tip on the solar arrays, it's about the length of a football field. You can see Joe here traversing uh, across the bottom part of the node, and then you got the shuttle arm up the left side. It truly is a magnificent view, and it's uh, incredibly large now. This is another example of uh, moving uh, to your work site uh, trying real hard not to be distracted by the view. The uh, helmet cam really gave you uh, an idea and gives you an idea of what it is like to be EVA. These are the DDCU cold plates that are used to regulate the temperature inside the DDCU, but they also make great mirrors. And you can see Carlos just turned on his helmet light in the, in the reflection, and the, my reflection is in the lower right corner. We use the pistol grip tool in many of our tasks, and in this case, uh, we're uh, loosening the uh, SASA beta gimbal bolts, and you can also see uh, the Endeavor and Unity and the rest of the station in the uh, background there. The docking adapter you see will have to be moved on the next mission so they can install the lab. In order to do that, we disconnected uh, many umbilical cables between the node and PMA2, as it's called. We also rele released cinch bolts off uh, two of the three radiators that were on P6. Here you can see my reflection in a radiator. These bolts had to be removed before the cinch could be deployed. And here you see a deployment of a radiator uh, following EVA2. The first task, task we had to do on EVA Day 3 was uh, repair the starboard solar array blanket box uh, tension problem. And uh, the ground did, team just did a fantastic job of developing a procedure for, for Carlos and me to follow. And here, Carlos is guiding the cable in with the tool while I control the rate of the uh, uh, reel rotation. A lot of people had worried about how hard it would be to do this. Uh, so we had a little uh, anxiety as to how it was going to go. But uh, we were very happy to see it work the first time. And uh, there's our enthusiastic <laughs> response right there. Uh, we also had to tear some things apart to be able to get to our work sites. Uh, here we had to remove a panel off the side of the node so that we could install an antenna cable that we would be using uh, with the floating potential probe. Uh, so um, I was hard at work there uh, in this scene. 
and Carlos was working so hard that I felt it was time to take a little time off, and I'm waving at the crew inside the crew module, and then enjoying the absolutely fantastic view of the Andes Mountains in Argentina as we went over. The final task we had was to install the floating potential probe on the top of P6, complete with a topping out evergreen tree and a short topping out ceremony. Uh, this scene is uh, kind of sad for me, and Joel recognizes it. It's the view from the top of P6 looking down at the Earth and Endeavor. Um, this was uh, one of the high points that we get, but it was also towards the end of all the work that we had done outside. Uh, by the time we finished the third EVA, we had the arrays deployed, the radiators were out, we could flow electricity and cool the station. Well, it was finally time to go uh, say hello to the station crew. The hatch you see being open there is the hatch between PMA3 and the node. And that's the shuttle crew actually floating in to the station. Um, Shep, Yuri, and Sergey uh, welcome, welcomed us aboard very warmly. And uh, Shep, being a Navy captain, uh, observed the Navy custom of ringing the bell as, as, uh, as we floated in. After uh, just a, a quick uh, picture in the node, we actually took the station crew into the shuttle flight deck. We're back in the shuttle flight deck now. So they could get a good look at the, at the P6, of their new power module, which they would be managing over the next several months. And that's the view that they saw out the overhead window. Well, after this, uh, all of us were going to head down into the service module so we could all get together and plan the next 24 hours because we had a lot of work to do. And here you see uh, Sergey uh, beckoning us through the uh, FGB, and we're on our way into the service module that you see in the, in the distance. And uh, uh, the FGB uh, is uh, basically a place where they store a lot of things, and now we're coming into the transfer module, and you can see the service module uh, with uh, Yuri and Sergey already there. And uh, this is basically the heart of the station at this point in time, and, uh, and we're going to take a little trip into what we call the state room, or one of the state rooms, which is where the, the crew basically have their sleeping compartment. And so this is one of them. It's not much bigger than a closet, but very, very comfortable. And uh, very uh, uh, good about it is the fact that they have a window, and you can see some uh, solar rays there, for both from P6 and the, as well as the, uh, the Russian modules. And of course, we had a meal together uh, before we set out to work and, uh, and uh, had some Russian food as well as uh, some uh, orbiter food. All too quickly, it was uh, time, to, time for us to leave. Um, we had the hatches open uh, just a little more than 24 hours. Um, we, we accomplished a great deal, and as we left, uh, Shep again observed the tradition of ringing uh, the bell on the, on the quarter deck as the crew departed. Uh, that's the uh, final hatch closure, and uh, we were getting ready for undocking. Uh, due to the great work of Lonnie Schmidt and his folks, we had enough propellant left where we could actually do the fly around of the International Space Station. And like the docking was at night, the, undock or the undocking was also at night. And we used a couple of small springs on the docking mechanism to push the two vehicles apart. And then once we got a couple feet apart, we fired the thrusters to increase the rate of uh, um, separation. Uh, it was interesting, looking up at the arrays, you could actually see the arrays ripple as we had fired those thrusters. Um, it was a team effort to do the fly around. I was actually at the controls and Brent was backing me up. Carlos had the uh, handheld laser and he was taking uh, the shots uh, for, to tell me the range. And then uh, Mark and uh, Joe were firing as many pictures as they could. It uh, took us uh, 45 minutes to do a complete fly around. Really incredible pictures. When you're up in space, most of the man-made things you see in space are white or black or, or silver or gray, pretty mundane colors. But with the huge solar arrays out now, um, he now added this very brilliant gold, sometimes orange, depending on how the sunlight hit the arrays. And it was a very pretty sight. I'll let you enjoy the view here for a second. Well, we were getting near the end of our mission, and uh, here's our empty cargo bay. We were sure glad that it was empty. And uh, <clears throat> like every crew uh, before coming back, we have to shoot a few scenes to, to show everybody that uh, we really were in weightlessness. And uh, this is a, a knob that we spun off our uh, exercise bicycle. And behind it, you can see a black uh, vent, and, and the air is actually blowing it away. And it's uh, just uh, going to keep going until it bumps into something. Well, we did get hungry while we were up there. 
So we had to eat M&Ms for 10 days. And of, course we, and of course, we also had to drink as well, although we usually used a straw. <laughs> Eating in space is always a great adventure. You do have to pay a little more attention to where your utensils are, however. <laughs> this picture or view uh, doesn't do justice to the northern lights, but I hope you get the point. It was a beautiful sight. And something you don't normally see from space, a meteor entering the atmosphere from above. Unfortunately, this uh, picture here doesn't show you the true beauty of what we were able to see with our naked eyeballs. Uh, every 45 minutes, we get to see a sunrise and a sunset. And it's just absolutely fabulous. Uh, but after all the fun, we had to get the uh, two important people uh, ready to do a couple hours worth of hard work and got them in their launch and entry suits uh, for all the work they'd be doing to get us home safely. It's, uh, it's really important when you're preparing for the deorbit burn um, that you secure everything that's been floating around the shuttle for about 11 days. Everything was pretty secure on the flight deck, as you can see. Joe did everything in the mid-deck pretty well, except for one camera. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I confessed a little bit uh, earlier to being uh, somewhat nervous or anxious about the rendezvous. Uh, I was not... Uh, nervous or anxious at all about the landing. You point the nose of the orbiter down, you're going to land. Um, <laughs> and this is, this is the view of the, uh, through the pilot's uh, HUD, and you can see we're shooting to land just about at the start of those, those lights, the centerline lights of the runway. Uh, it's pretty amazing. You uh, start this process over Australia, and you're able to touch down within 100 feet or so of your desired point. Uh, so that's pretty, that's pretty impressive. It's uh, a great testament to the technology of the shuttle. After we were on the ground, Mike deployed the drag chute to help slow us down. Uh, we derotated to get the nose on the ground, and uh, the next big task for me was to stop with the nose tire directly on the centerline lights. It took us uh, about an hour or so to get out of the vehicle. We had, we had some things to do, and that's a pretty interesting shot of the crew working afterwards. And then we had a chance to get out and thank uh, the folks at KSC for giving us a, a great vehicle. <laughs> 